Good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Blessing to be with you. And uh, those of you at camp, you're supposed to know better than that. How do we begin our mornings? Are they really good? Well, we need to say so. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. It is good to see everyone here this morning, and it is good to be here. Uh, we are here, and we are finishing up a series of studies that we have done together with the book of Nehemiah. And before I get back into all of that, I'll... Uh, well, my wife was very quick about all of that. I was going to give her a chance. But anyway, uh, she... Uh, uh, skip that part. We just want to say thank you all um, for uh, the time that we have had here in... in uh, well, Lampong... Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Lamut. What did I say Lampong? Was there another Lampong? Anyway, uh, Lamut. Lamut. Uh, I'll remember all these places. My Malaysian geography, not so good. Uh, but uh, it, was a, it was an enjoyable camp. If you weren't there, you missed out on something very special. Uh, we want to thank all of you who organized this and all of you who made it so special. Thank you for uh, being a part of it. And also, uh, I want to thank you for the special care that was given to us. We really felt welcome. And I know that for some of you, this is our first time meeting. And so we thank you for making that first time a special time for us. And we do hope that uh, you'll have us back at EPO. We'd like to come back and uh, really enjoy uh, what we've seen of the place so far. This is a beautiful city that you have, and, and God has really blessed you all to be able to live in this park. I, I don't know why people would want to leave EPO and go to KL. Uh, <laughs> leave, leave the mountains and go to the Valley of Smog. <laughs> you know, Jerusalem was on a, on a hilltop, and then around it was a valley. It was called the Valley of Gehenna. And that was an illustration that people used for, uh, that Jesus used for hell, uh, because it was a place with a lot of trash and a lot of smoke, uh, because people were burning the trash. And I think, well, if they leave you follow the mountaintop and then they go down to the Valley of Klein. Well, uh, anyway, it was not a good idea. <laughs> Beautiful place that you all have here. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, if you all will open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 11, I'm going to use an illustration that will be foreign to you, it's becoming quite foreign to me. I don't keep up with American football anymore. But there was an American football team that did something that, that, no, uh, that only one other American football team had done in the history of American football. And they won three championships in the span of four years. This team was called the New England Patriots. And, and so not only did they win that three championships in four years, they also put together a winning streak of 21 consecutive wins. Now, keep in mind that there are only 16 games in the regular season. And so they had wins spanning across seasons. And so continuously winning. It's almost like you got bored watching the Patriots because you always knew that they were going to win. And the, 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 the question was, how was this team so successful? You don't need to understand the sport to appreciate the fact that all these records that were broken and all uh, of the, the ability that these people had. How did they get to that point? Well, there was a book that was actually written uh, about that very subject. I don't recommend necessarily reading it. I have not. But I've read the uh, summary of this book. And the book is called Patriot Reign. And uh, one of the, the, uh, the most interesting things that came out of this book and the, the point that was being made from this book is that uh, one of the things that this, that this team focused on was the idea of the team concept. And the way that they illustrated that was that every time they went out to play a game, there was a sign that they would all look at. And the sign said, individuals play the game, but teams win championships. Individuals play the game, but teams win championships. And it helped that team to understand that, that mentality, that philosophy, helped the team to understand that it was only together that they were going to succeed and only when each individual was coming together that they were going to succeed. We talked in the camp about the idea of coordination, about each person working and each person being involved, at least in the men's class we did. But today we're going to talk about participation. Not just the need for each person to be active, but for each of us to be working together. And we're going to consider some ways that we do need to be working together. Let's talk about the idea of participation from this standpoint that we serve a, a real God and we face a real enemy. If we don't want to lose in terms of our, our, our soul, in terms of the race that we're running, even the, the, the fight that we're fighting, you might even call it in comparison to sports, uh, if we don't want to lose the game, then we need to be aware of the devil 
and we need to be working together against it. The devil has a game plan. He knows how to work against us, and he is using his team against our team. But with Christ on our side, if we will put ourselves into place where we should be, if we will participate, then what we're going to see is that we can win. We can succeed. Now, what is participation, and why is it important? I'm going to give you a couple of definitions, as I've done all along, and then we'll begin to reflect on those. The first definition that I'd like to give you is the act of sharing in the activities of the group. And so participation, of course, involves an action, but it's not an individual action alone. It's the act of sharing, the act of coming together into one, sharing in the activities of a larger group. All right? The second definition that I'd like to give you is the condition of sharing in common with others. And so not only are you sharing in the activities of the group, but you are sharing in common with others. That means that they have a part, you have a part, and you all are just parts that are coming together to be part of a whole, sharing in common with others as fellows or partners and so on. So these are definitions of the word participation. Now, that's what it is. The question is, why is it important? Well, as we think about participation, participation is important because Christianity is a group effort realize that? Christianity is a group effort. Now it's not going to be on the day of judgment that we're going to be able to say, I was lost because of what someone else did. No, we're not going to be able to say that. We're not going to be able to blame anyone else for where we wind up on the day of judgment. We all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but we don't have to give an account for what anyone else has done. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we give an account for what we have done in our bodies, whether it be good or bad. And so we don't have to worry about what others have done, but at the same time, the only way that we're going to be able to succeed, the only way that we're going to be able to stand and work against the team that Satan has comprised of the, the world around us, the only way that we're going to succeed against that team is to work together. Christianity is a group effort. As we think about being a Christian, we gave up our individual identity. We gave up the idea of self and me, religiously speaking, when we became a Christian. Why? If you think about the requirement of discipleship that Jesus gives in Luke 9.23, he said that anyone that would come to him had to take up his cross, deny himself, and then it even says to do so daily, to take up your cross daily. Now, as you think about that, taking up your cross daily, what does that mean? Well, to put it into perspective, a cross is something that they used in the first century as an execution device. I'm not sure what the execution device is here in Malaysia. Is it hanging or is it uh, lethal injection? I don't know. Don't... Don't find out, so don't commit some crime and have to find out what the, the execution device is. I think that you all do have the, the capital punishment here, I believe. Uh, in any event, let's just say that it is what it is sometimes in my country, the, the, the uh, lethal injection. They actually give you an injection and then that, that, that actually kills you along those lines. Well, can you imagine Jesus saying, uh, take up your lethal injection every single day and follow me? Well, it's, it's a strange picture, isn't it, then to say, take up your cross and follow me. What's he saying? He's not saying that we need to, to uh, uh, go around and bear the idea of, uh, of killing ourselves all the time. That's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about the idea of self being put to death. We are setting aside every single day self on the cross of sacrifice. We are no longer focusing on ourselves. We are focusing on Christ. He becomes our head. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, the head of every man is Christ. And what does that mean? It means that I can't be the one who directs my life anymore. I can't be this individual doing his own thing or her own thing. I have to do what Christ wants me to do. The body can't have two heads. The church can't have two heads. And so I cannot be the one who guides who directs my life by myself. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, whatever we do, in word or deed, we are to do all by the name of the Lord Jesus. So we're to be looking to Him. What does He want me to do today? 
What does he want me to do with my life? And so on. And you were not baptized as an individual to be saved as an individual. You were added to a body. When we obeyed the gospel, we were baptized according to the Spirit's instructions. We were, we were added to a body. We were placed in a body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. And we need to reflect on that. That what we have and who we are is now tied to all other Christians. You know, I like Malaysia, but uh, there are certain parts of Malaysia that I like more than other parts. And uh, there are times when uh, we, we uh, have a lot in schedule in, in Singapore and uh, a lot that we have to do. So why do we keep coming back to Malaysia? I looked at my passport and uh, I noticed that we had been to Malaysia 12 times in the past year. We don't have uh, a blood family here. Uh, we, we didn't go any of those times to go sightseeing or anything. Why did we come? We came because you all are our family. And because we want to help you. Because we reflected on the idea that, that we're in a church. And the church is bigger than just one congregation. The church is worldwide. And so we made the decision that even though at times it's a bit inconvenient, you know, we, uh, especially the ride to Malacca. Oh, I love Malacca, but I hate the ride to Malacca that there's no easy way to go to Malacca. You have to take a bus, and all the bus companies are the same. <laughs> and you just, oh, it's by the end of all of that. And, and, but uh, but you, you do that, and, and, and you go and you, and, you, and you spend some time with the brethren there, and, and all that ends up being a very enjoyable experience for us because we realize something. That church, those are our brothers and sisters, and we feel like we're going to see family. We need to treat the church like that and give that kind of sacrifice to it. I imagine for those who can't speak English, that must have been pretty entertaining. But anyway. <laughs> Participation is also important because individual Christians must share in that effort. Individual Christians must share in uh, that effort. We're, 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 we're giving ourselves over to a greater effort, and we have to, as individuals, share in that effort. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Do you know what a spectator sport is? Uh, some of the uh, spectator sports are, are, well, spectator sport is where you, you make a sport or you make a game of watching others do things. You know, men, when you're watching, uh, I know Victor likes Liverpool, I suppose that you all uh, follow the English Premier League and things like this. You're watching those games and you say, pass the ball, pass the ball. And so you're, you're getting into it like it's a sport, but you're not playing the game. And there are people who treat the church like that. Why he make that decision? Ah, so terrible already. You know, you get so upset about the decisions the men make, or you you uh, you get upset about what this brother or what this sister has done, but then you you, you actually reflect and you know aren't really doing anything yourself, not doing anything for the Lord. Well, along those lines, Christianity is not a spectator sport. In fact, in First Peter chapter two and verse twelve, it says that we are to have our conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against us as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. People aren't supposed to be spectating in the church. In fact, we're supposed to be living and allowing the world to watch us. They're supposed to be able to see our good works and behold them and then come to glorify God through them. The same thing is said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Christianity is a cause that we should work, rally around. Victor has in his car a sticker uh, that says Liverpool. He's very proud to be a supporter of Liverpool. Uh, I am proud to be a supporter of the Hawthorne Hawks. I, I follow Australian uh, football, which is not soccer, by the way. I'll tell you about that game afterwards if you want to know. The best sport, but that's why I don't follow American football anymore. I follow Australian football. But anyway, Christianity is a greater cause than the Hawthorne Hawks or than Liverpool, or than Manchester, or whatever other soccer team, or football team, or other sport that you can possibly imagine. It's more worthy. If you're going to get excited about something, get excited about the cause of Christ. Paul said, for this cause, I, Paul, a prisoner for you Gentiles. And so he saw Christianity as a cause, something that was worthy of his individual effort and sacrifice. Another reason why participation is important it's important because we as individual Christians need to share with each other. We need not only to share in the effort, but we need to share with each other in that effort. Because we're in a body, and each member of that body is important. 
I will I often say this describing myself in the church. I need you, you need me. Now, I'm not saying that to be prideful. I'm saying that to remind myself that I have something to offer you. I'm a part of a body. But I need you, though. I need you because I'm only one part of the body. I, I think sometimes, what part of the body would I be? Maybe the mouth. I don't know. I, I, I don't seem to have a lot of talent, except for I seem to be able to talk. I don't know. <laughs> Some people say you talk too much. <laughs> right. Well, uh, along those lines, uh, I, there are things that I can't do, and I need help with. And I need you to help me with these things. And that's, that's what it is to be in the body of Christ. We share together in those things. Now, the Jews of Nehemiah's day understood the importance of participation. Nehemiah 11 is all about this. And, and I love what this passage is actually describing. Even though there's not a lot, I'll be honest with you, of all the chapters of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 11 is the hardest one to take lessons from. Because it's describing a very unique situation that you have to really reflect on to try to find some individual or even church application. But as you read through Nehemiah 11, it's all about participation. I want to try to set the stage so you understand. You remember in camp, we talked about how they're rebuilding Jerusalem, right? But Jerusalem is underpopulated. And so how are we going to get people back into Jerusalem? Underpopulated means there's not enough people living in this big city. How are we going to bring people back to Jerusalem? Do you know that what they ended up doing, and that's what our scripture reader, reader uh, uh, recorded, what Calvin read for us, he read for us the fact that what they ended up doing was they cast lots. And so uh, they, for every ten people uh, that were Jews, one would stay in Jerusalem and nine would stay in the surrounding countryside. Now, how would you like, you know, our, our sister up here has a very, has a very nice house. And I'm sure a lot of you have nice houses. How would you like for your house to be chosen at random? Have you ever thought about this chapter and what they did? I don't know if you have or not, but how would you like for your house to be chosen at random? Would you be willing to, to, to be so concerned with the overall well-being of your country, uh, which is what they are doing here in Israel? Uh, they're so concerned with the well-being of their country that they're actually allowing their house to be chosen at random. And not only that, as you think about this, the Jews were, were allowing others to control where they lived against their natural desires. You know, we like cities, uh, especially in Asian culture. People like cities. You, you find that people are flocking to city centers. Uh, this is very different in my country. There are some who like cities, but many who still live in the countryside, happy to do so. Uh, you come to cities for the opportunity and the gain and all that you can do in cities, but do you realize in this period of time, it's not that way. You come to a city and often the living conditions actually aren't as good as what you could have in the country. Uh, they, they, they don't have, in many cases, the kind of plumbing that we have, and so cities are more dirty. They don't have the same kind of economic opportunities that you have today. Uh, these ideas of people being doctors and lawyers and real estates and all these things that happen in cities are not really happening in this time period. And so to live in Jerusalem is actually a sacrifice. You're not doing what your ancestors have done, which is probably to work the land, to be farmers and these kind of things, which is what they knew and what they wanted to do. And so they were sacrificing to be a part of this. And, and so they, they cared so much about the cause that they were willing to sacrifice themselves and, as individuals. And that's really what we're trying to illustrate. That's the point. I'm not telling you to allow the Malaysian government to tell you where to live, all right? They, they probably would have you uh, go and live in all the terrible places, and they would allow, allow their families to live in all the nice places if they could control it, I'm sure. So I'm not telling you to necessarily do that for the Malaysian government. But what you should be willing to do for the church is say, all right, this cause is so important that I'm going to allow the cause to direct my life. I'm not going to be so focused about what I want. I'm going to think about the cause first. I'll give you an illustration of this. I had a good friend uh, a good family for, uh, uh, that was uh, husband and wife, the friends of mine, they, uh, they were very discouraged about the church where they were. Uh, the church was going nowhere. Uh, they, they were trying to help, trying to change, but they were getting burned out. And, and so they were thinking about moving somewhere else. And uh, I told them this. I said, pick the church first. Many times people will say, I want to pick the job 
and then cross my fingers, hope there's a church. Or pick the university, cross my fingers, that's an expression in English, by the way, I saw some pearl brows. That means hope so, hope so, you know, hope there's a church there. I can't tell you how many times parents have written me and said, Brother Swain, is there a, a, a church in Mozambique or some crazy place in the middle of nowhere? And, and, and because why? They, 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 they've already got their child signed up for this university. In fact, they're going in one week's time. And all of a sudden it occurred to them, hang on, is there a church there? And so they, they ask, Brother Swain, is there a church in this place? And, and, and I'll say, well, I don't know, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, I'll Google, I'll, I'll ask people that I know, I don't know why they can't Google, but anyway, I'll Google, and, and I'll, I'll look up and, and try to find it, and, 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 and sometimes I'll find one, sometimes I won't, sometimes I'll say, well, there's this one, but it's not so good, and, and what happened, the reason that all that problem happened is because people put their individual desires before the church. When in Nehemiah chapter 11, it was the exact opposite. They were putting the nation of Israel and the glory of God ahead of themselves. Well, I would suggest that's what we need to do as well. We need to put the church ahead of ourselves. Living in Jerusalem meant danger. It also meant leaving your inheritance. To help you understand what it was that they were doing, in chapter 11 and verse number 20, the residue of Israel... The priests, the Levites, were in all the cities of, Jer of Judah, every one in his inheritance. Jerusalem was not their inheritance. And so there were one in ten people who were opening themselves up to the risk of not having their ancestral family land. And I know that we can't appreciate that like they did, but it was a big thing for them. Now, I'll tell you that story. I, I actually lost my plot here. I was telling the story about that family. To, I was telling them to seek the church and then seek the job. Here's what happened. They moved to a place where there was a strong congregation. And then they began looking for a job. You know what? God provided them with a the job. And I've seen it happen that way so many times. Where, where people will put the right decisions in place first. You know, as it relates to your education... Uh, I know that you might think that education in this city or in this place is so great and I've got to send my children to this place or that place. At the end of the day, education is not what will make your child or break your child. It will be their individual work ethic. It will be their attitude, how they carry themselves in interviews and so on. And so at the end of the day, as long as they're getting a university education, it's probably not going to matter whether it came from a place that has a church or a place that doesn't have a church. And so here's the advice. Pick the church and then pick the school. Pick the church and then pick the school. If that's abroad, pick the church and pick the school. If it's in Malaysia, pick the church and pick the school. I'm glad you're having this university outreach uh, in uh, the neighboring town. It's very good that you're doing that. Uh, but there's not always that opportunity. And we don't want to send our children into wastelands. We don't want to send our children to places where uh, they're not going to have an opportunity to be with God's people. Pick the church first and allow that to illustrate every point that you make in your life, every decision that you make. Now, the people along these lines, what they did was they offered themselves willingly. The attitude was fantastic. In fact, it says, and the people blessed all the men, verse 2, that willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. It was a sacrifice. It wasn't what they wanted to do, but for the glory of God's people in those days, they sacrificed themselves. They participated. Along those lines, we see that it was a total participation. Basically, what chapter 11 is, is a hall of fame of all of the people who were willing to sacrifice and to be a part of the Jerusalem rebuilding project by actually living there and making, setting up their families there. You see that many people were involved. Warriors were involved. In verse number 6, the sons of Perez that dwelled at Jerusalem were 403 score and 8 valiant men. In scripture, valiant men often used to describe those who were soldiers. And so soldiers were involved in it. It involved those who were common workers. In verse 12, and their brethren that did the work of the house were 8 and 20 and 2. And so the names of those who were workers. It involved those who were watchers or who were overseers, leaders, those who would guide and help others. In verse number 14, and the brethren, uh, the mighty men of valor, and hundred, twenty and 8, and their overseer. Uh, this man named Zabdiel uh, was one of the great men. So he was a, an overseer, a watcher, maybe a general of that army, those valiant men are soldiers. It involved worshipers. 
in verse number 17, Mataniah, the son of Misha, uh, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin thanksgiving in prayer. All right, so there's prayer happening. There's worship happening as these people are taking their place in the city of Jerusalem. And basically, what you can see from all of those things is that, yes, it did involve everyone. Whatever was needed to be done to make this city inhabitable again, they did it. Whatever it took. Uh, they did the work of the house of God, for example. In verse 12, their brethren that did the work of the house. That's talking about the temple. So people who were working and continually refurbishing this temple that uh, had just been rebuilt a few uh, decades before. The upkeep of the outside of the house was also undertaken. In verse 16, uh, we find that two individuals, the chief of the Levites, had the oversight of the outward business of the house of God. So they're taking care of things in the city. And also obedience to the king's decrees, making sure that that nation could endure by submitting itself to their external government. In fact, you find that uh, in verse 22, the overseer also of the Levites at Jerusalem was Uzziah, the son of Bani, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Matani, the son of Misha, uh, the sons of Asaph, the singers were over the business of the house of God, for it was the king's commandment concerning them that a certain portion should be for the singers do for every day. And so they were also obeying uh, the king's decrees. The Persian government wanted to see all, uh, really, temples of all religions up and running. And so that's why there was an interest there, if you were wondering about that. We can talk more about that on some other occasion. But as you consider all of those things, we realize that we're not called to participate in a city. We're not called to participate in a temple. Nor are we called to rebuild walls. So let's think about some areas in which we should be involved as Christians. How can we participate as Christians? Well, we're going to be examining something from Scripture, a word uh, called fellowship. Fellowship is a word in the Bible that refers to the idea of participation. In fact, the Greek word koinonia, uh, it's translated participation in some of the newer versions. What that word is and what it means is a rich involvement and inclusion. It's used 20 times in the Bible. And so let's think about some of the categories of things that we as Christians should be involving ourselves in, some things that we should be participating in as we try to make application of Nehemiah chapter 11 to our lives. All right. First of these is that participation is needed to have unity. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3. First John chapter 1 and verse number 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship. That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now fellowship as you think about it is something more than uh, it is in some congregations. You know, we have in uh, the U.S., we have these things called fellowship meals. Do you have these things here? Uh, I'm not sure what your practice is or what you call these things. Fellowship meals. The fellowship meals is only one side of fellowship. Fellowship is not just eating together. Fellowship is part participation together. It's participation based upon learning. As you can see, John is writing these things so that they can all be united on the same belief. That takes effort. It takes individual effort, which is why we talked earlier about the stone of education. Didn't someone say something about cell phones at the beginning, and mobile phones at the beginning of the list? Anyway, second way that we need to think about participation yeah. or unity. Participation or unity also described the financial giving that Christians did. Look at Romans chapter 15 and verse 26. Romans chapter 15 and verse 26. It says, For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain, now the King James Version says their contribution. Do you realize that's actually the word fellowship or the word koinonia or the idea of participation? How did the brethren at Macedonia and Achaia saw them, see themselves participating in the work at the church at Jerusalem? Well, they, they viewed themselves as being, as we've said, members of a universal church. And they said that that actually means something. That when there is a need over here in Jerusalem, 
that we have to sacrifice for that need. Financially, they put their money where their mouth was. If you're going to preach that the Bible is the Word of God and the church is the body of Christ, then how is it that we can look at congregations that are struggling in other places and not help them? Now, sometimes that is a financial help that is needed. Sometimes it is a moral help that was needed. Uh, Victor and I were talking about the fact that uh, uh, the church at Penang is looking for right now a worker. They want to send someone to Four Seas College. And so the need for them right now is not money, but it's someone to go to Four Seas, to train themselves to be a worker for the Lord, and then to go and do what Victor is doing here over there. Now, can any of us think about taking up that challenge? Can any of us think about maybe not necessarily looking now, but looking at the younger people, the people that are building themselves up and growing up? Well, can we direct them towards that direction? How is it that this person magically wound up in Malaysia? I'm talking about me. How, how did I get over here? You know, uh, was it a magic carpet? How did I get over here? Well, I grew up at a congregation that believed very powerfully in the idea of mission work and in sending people out to other places. Every single year we would have something called a mission forum where missionaries from all over the world would come and, and tell us about their works in various places, places like Africa, places like the Pacific Islands, uh, Asia. We found out about all these amazing works and, and we got excited about the idea. But not only that, we actually put some action onto the idea. Uh, we as young men would uh, conduct the services once a month. We were Christians. Uh, we would conduct the services once a month. I started preaching when I was nine years old. And, uh, the, uh, and that wasn't an uncommon thing back then uh, because the, the children, as soon as they were baptized, were involved in the work of the church. And so we would, we would conduct the services. And then on the following Sunday, all of us kids would go and they would drive us to a small congregation out in the country. By the way, that could be a command. Uh, you know, they drive us to this small country congregation and we would help them and conduct their services for them and encourage them and build them up along those lines. And that got me into the habit, not only of, of uh, uh, being involved in the work of the church and preparing myself to be a preacher and teacher, but also it helped me to begin to look out at needs in other places. And so that was created in me very young. And I tell you that not to, not to brag on myself. I'm not unique in that congregation at Forest Park. There are a number of us who became preachers and teachers along those lines. And it's because we started early. So maybe we can look at the next generation and say, who of these people can be workers for the Lord? Rather than forcing them into being something like a, a, just in that pursuit of money. Uh, we want them to be lawyers, doctors, these kind of things because they make a lot of money. Well, rather than doing that, what if we say we want them to be workers for the Lord? And we will use our money, we will use our resources to help make that a reality. I would love it if that were the case. That's what you see happening here in Romans 15, 26. They were putting their money into participating in the Lord's work. It is also used to describe Christians just generally working together. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 4, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The fellowship, the joint participation, the koinonia of the ministering, of the service to the saints. They were working together to serve one another. Are there people in this congregation uh, or people that have been in this congregation in the past, maybe they are shut-ins right now, they're too old to come out on a regular basis? Could the congregation here do what other congregations have done, maybe even what we have done also in the past? Could you look out to these other people and say, these old people, they can't clean their house very well. Their houses are, are decaying. Could you go to their houses, the younger people in the congregation, and clean their houses? Uh, get up on their roofs and, and patch holes. Uh, clean out the, uh, the, the, the yard, make it look nice. Clean out the inside of the house. We did this one time. We went to someone's house and we found that one of our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, was a sister in Christ, a widow. She was living in her house and she had cockroaches running all over the floor. And the ladies were in there cleaning and the cockroaches were running across their hands. And this sister could not take care of herself, but no one was caring for her. And so maybe we need to think about working together to serve one another, to serve or minister to the saints. 
We also should be involved in, in, in working together, fellowshipping in the, in the Lord's Supper. Do you know the word fellowship is used? The word koinonia, participation, is used in the Lord's Supper. And the reason I bring that up is because we have an opportunity in just a few moments to partake of the Lord's Supper. In that action, we're to be focused on Jesus Christ. We're participating in His sufferings. And we are sharing together in His body and in His blood, reminding ourselves of the sacrifice for us. But there are some Christians who are so careless about the Lord's Supper. We see some Christians, they'll, they'll have the, the, they just have taken the grape juice, right? And they immediately are opening up their psalm book. Come on, roll it along, hurry up. They're not focusing, they're not dwelling on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which we must do. And finally, it is used to describe our faith and spreading our faith to others, rather. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6. This is a book we don't often turn to. It's a very short book. The book of Philemon, right before the book of Hebrews. In verse number 6, it says that the communication, and that's actually the word fellowship, or the participation, the, partition, the participation of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Jesus Christ. It's only when you acknowledge what is in you. It's only, therefore, when you spread forth or spread out what is in you, when you participate in the spreading forth of what is in you, that that becomes effectual, that that becomes powerful. To preach the gospel, we don't need individuals like Victor. We need a church, a church that is united. We need a church that is united, and each person is doing their part to spread the gospel. If there is only one person active in the spreading of the gospel, or only a few people active in the spreading of the gospel, when visitors come, they'll look at us and they'll say, hypocrites. They'll say, I don't want to be involved in this, and they'll leave. People will actually be able to, to see whether or not we're truly involved, and whether we truly care about the mission that our Lord and Savior has called us to do. Unity giving, cooperative work, worship, and evangelism. As you think about it, that's what we are called to do. We're not called to repopulate Jerusalem. We're not called to fill up any cities along those lines. That is our call to duty. And so the, the question is, are we participating? Are we participating? And here's the test for whether or not we are participating. If you open up to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And you look at verse number 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I think we sang that this morning. I didn't ask the person to sing that. That's a good song. Anyway, the fellowship of his sufferings. How do I know whether or not I'm truly participating? Easy question. Whether or not I am actually suffering anything for the cause of Christ. If I'm not experiencing his sufferings, if in other words I haven't had someone make fun of me, I haven't lost out on money or a business transaction, I've not lost out on an education opportunity, if I've not lost anything for my Christianity, then you know what? My Christianity is worthless. Suffering will happen. It's not a pleasant thing, it's not a desirable thing, but it will happen if you truly practice the Word of God. Are you participating in His sufferings? Is there anything that you've lost for the Lord? The promise, though, if you will lose for the Lord, is that you can gain for the Lord because individuals play the game. The teams win championships. And we have a great opportunity to win together. To win together. I want to encourage you to examine the call of Koinonia, fellowship. Look at those words. Do your own study of the 20 times where the word fellowship is found in the New Testament. See where those words are found and ask yourself, am I participating in that? Am I participating in contribution? Am I participating in work? Am I participating in giving? Am I participating in the service to the Lord? We're going to turn it over to Victor now, and Victor will have some words of exhortation for the other brethren. Oh 
，身体只有一个，但是肢体有很多。哥罗第哥罗呃哥林多前书第十二章，那我们都是耶稣基督的肢体，我们必须要互相的来参与。那参与是什么呢？参与就是要付出，然后呢，我们必须要参与，就是要互相的来扶持。互相的来造就，就是来互相的一起来走回天家。那我们知道，在彼得前书第五章第八节，告诉我们魔鬼就好像那怒吼的狮子，那吼叫的狮子。那我们知道，当一个人很低落、没有信心的时候，那就是撒旦最想要来试探他们的时候。但是要是我们参与，一起成为一个团队的话，我们就可以坚持的来抵挡这些魔鬼的试探，魔鬼的这些骚扰。那我们知道团队是很重要的，更何况我们基督徒并不是一个人要走回天家，而是我们全部弟兄姐妹都希望我们可以一同走回天家。那我们要知道参与的意思就是说，并不是靠个人的，而是一起的，把我们有的一起分享出来。分享我们的信心，我们的才干，我们有的知识，我们有的能力，我们要互相的用出来，参与在教会里的工作。那我们知道，分享是一个呃，可以是一个开心的，或者是伤心的。因为圣经也有告诉我们，我们分享不不管是好的还是不好的，我们是一个身体，我们是一个家庭，我们都要一起受苦，然后要一起来快乐。那参与重要吗？参与很重要，为什么？因为他基督徒我们是一起的，在哥林多后书五章十节告诉我们，当我们受精了之后，我们被加入一个身体，他身体就是神的教会。这个教会不是属于我的，也不是属于你的，而是属于我们大家的。基督的教会是属于大家的。那我们要合作，我们要舍己，怎样才能够参与？怎样才能够付出？我们要像路加福音第九章二十三。节一样，我们要愿意扛那十字架，我们要愿意舍己，舍弃我们个人的思想，为了大家团队的成功，这个就是我们为什么要参与。那我们也知道，就是说，当我们舍己的时候，就是我们不在乎自己的，我们不想得到自己的利益，而是要为主耶稣基督而得到利益。那我们当然，我们要付出，教会才能够成长。我们要一起。工作，教会才能够成长，这个就是我们所学习到的。而在哥罗西书第三章十七节，也告诉我们，我们凡做的、我们的行为、我们所说的一切、所做的一切，都要遵耶稣基督来做。那怎样才能够遵耶稣基督基督来做？需要有他的教导，需要有一群同一个信心的、同一个信仰的，我们才能够这样子做。那我们知道，身体只有一个，但是肢体有很多。我们每个都是教会，我们每个都是耶稣的身体。我们可以是教会的手，我们可以是教会的脚，教会的嘴巴，因为我们有不同的才干，我们有不同的能力。那他告诉我们，就是在尼西米尼西米记第十一章，他告诉我们，当时尼西米记第十一章，那些人犹太人，他们并不在乎自己的重要性，为的是什么？为的是大家。在尼西米记第十一章。第一节就告诉我们，当时犹太人他们就以抽签的方式，十个人里面有一个可以留在耶路撒冷，但是呢，九个必须要到其他的城邑去。那我们愿意这样子吗？我们愿意为了舍弃自己而完全教会的工作，来振作教会的工作吗？这就是我们要思考的。那我们也知道，这是因为他们愿意让其他人来帮他们做一个决定，为的是一个。团队的成就，团队的成功，那教会也应该这样子做。那我们知道，神他把教会成为一个家庭，我们是教会这一份子，我们是个人的家庭成员，我们是弟兄姐妹。那我们需要业力舍己，为的是要帮助弟兄姐妹的成长。那我们在教会里头是一个集体的成就。那我们知道，我们组织来到教会是为了要造就。为了要互相鼓励，这就是我们怎样参与，怎样付出。那我们知道，统一的参与，就是我们必须要统一的在一起。就是像耶稣在约翰福音十七章二十到二十一节告诉我们，我们要合而为一。怎样才能够合而为一？当我们愿意付出，愿意参与，我们才能够
合而为一。那第二点，他告诉我们，我们要在怎样的情况下或者环环境之下来参与？他就说到，我们必须要在团契的方式，就是要以团契彼此相交的方式来合而为一。在约翰一书第一章第三节。约翰一书第一章第三节告诉我们，我们要和神相交，我们也要和弟兄姐妹和众人相交。这个就是团契，这个就是在这样子的环境之下，我们要来参与。那我们参与不单只是参与，我们要一起来学习，一起来付出。就好像尼西米记那个时候，他们在尼西米记的时候，他们怎样呢？他们都很乐意的来，来做出捐献呐、啊，来做出。钱财上的帮助，那同样的，我们教会也应该这样子的来付出，为了是要帮各个弟兄姐妹来能够一起鼓励，来能够有一个好的信心，有一个坚强的信心，来一同走回天家。在罗马书十五章二十六节告诉我们，就是说我们要互相扶持，我们要。在有需要的弟兄姐妹上，我们要给他们来帮助，无论在无论是在钱财、探望，去探望他们，他们有病痛，或者是照顾他们，这些都是我们应该要付出的。而我们要付出，就要以很乐意的心态去付出。那在哥林多后书第八章第四节，哥林多后书第八章第四节告诉我们，我们要互相扶持，我们要互相参与，因为我们知道，就连待会我们将要领的圣餐。我们每个组织，我们领圣餐，领圣餐也是我们一起来统一在一起，来纪念耶稣基督的死，纪念耶稣基督的复活。这个就是为什么我们要参与，我们要成为一体，我们要统一来一起做一些为基督做一些比较有意义的事情。然后呢，在腓利门书，腓利门书第一章第六节，他告诉我们说，我们有同样的信心，我们的信心是同样的。那我们也要为基督来行善，为基督来参与行善，做一些帮助各弟兄姐妹成长的一些事情。那我们知道，我们要问自己一个问题。那我们要问自己一个问题：说我们到底有没有参与教教会的活动的时候，我们就要看在腓立比书第三章第十节，腓立比书第三章第十节告诉说，我们要和基督一同受苦。我们要效法耶稣的死，我们要怎样和一同基督一同受苦？就是要参与，要付出，要舍己。所以今天早上我们学习到的课程就是要怎样来参与教会的工作，怎样来相交，为的是要怎样？为的是要使教会能够壮大，使福音能够广传。这个就是我们今天早上所看到的。好。我们现在就呃一起来齐力唱诗歌。Let's not stand as we 呃 sing a song of encouragement。诗歌第八十二首 Hymn eighty two。Hymn eighty two。Yeah. 